What can I, as a DM, do to give my players more control over their adventure? Designing sandbox adventures was never my preferred approach, and I confess I didn't like them at all. Then I realized that, well, I didn't really know how to use them. But one important part is missing, the one thing that compels my players to move from one encounter to the next. I call that encounter triggers. Those two elements put together are a practical example of player agency. They bring freedom of choice, risk of failure, and their associated benefits and consequences. But which of those adventure structures do I like the most? Well, all of them. What I really try to do is choose which of them better fits what I'm creating. Hello and welcome to the Deep Dice Press. We are a bunch of friends in their 30s who have played D&D since our teen years and love role-playing and storytelling. On a given day, it just so happened that we were all going through career and transitions and thought, why not give a shot at developing D&D products? And that's how our indie D&D publisher was born. Small in size, but big in aspirations. Our purpose is to take your D&D adventures to the magical excitement and deep immersion we experience with the epic tales and narratives of humankind. If you think our number of followers does not reflect our content quality, be a good cultist and help our greedy dragon to expand its horde of likes, subscriptions and bell clicks. You can also find the links for our social media in the description down below. Adventures with immersive storytelling sometimes are not enough for my players. When my adventures are too linear, they may feel frustrated with the low degree of freedom to navigate through the encounters. Sandboxes, on the other hand, may also render lower engagement for my players if they lack an exciting story. And then there are adventures with both immersive storytelling and great player freedom. They are usually an awesome experience for my players, and not less often, quite distressful for myself. How to balance all that? Well, there were two things I did to give my players more freedom without overwhelming myself. I'll talk about 1. What I did to allow my D&D players to shape how our adventures unfold. We'll talk about what encounter nodes are, why they determine the adventure structure and the trade-off between player freedom and game design workload. Two, what I did to create stories using sandbox adventures. I used to think that sandboxes were not appropriate for adventures inclined towards storytelling. I was wrong and learning to use sandboxes properly taught me the importance of encounter triggers. I learned to think about my adventure design before I started to prepare them. With that, I managed to improve both my storytelling and my player's agency. Using those tools took my DM skills to a different level, and I hope that sharing those experiences will be as helpful for you as they are for me. So join us, won't you? Let's start talking about adventure nodes and what I did to allow my D&D players to shape how our adventures unfold. I use a few alternatives to integrate storytelling with my adventure structures, and they each involve a trade-off between player freedom and the game design workload. What can I, as a DM, do to give my players more control over their adventure? Freedom of choice is one of the coolest things about D&D, and I try to keep that in mind while writing my adventures. Recently, my players were about to engage in a siege of the city of Suzeo. Before that, however, they had just come to know that a neighboring tribe of giants, which so far had had, had, had no interest in meddling with the affairs of the small folk, could have a solid reason to join arms with the party's allies, a common enemy. A precious artifact to the giant tribe had been stolen years ago, and the party had the means to prove their enemy was responsible for that. The giant's alliance could tilt the scales in favor of the party's allies as, you know, giants in a siege. Throughout the entire campaign, this giant tribe had been spoken of as stubborn and dangerous. It sounded like a cool quest, 
Establish delicate, delicate diplomatic talks with someone who could have little patience to hear what you have to say. But again, they were stubborn, so there should be real chances the players could fail. And they were also dangerous, so there was a chance the players would rather not risk their necks on that quest. Those two elements put together are a practical example of player agency. They bring freedom of choice, risk of failure, and their associated benefits and consequences. It also, creates, it also creates some branches for the design of the adventure. The connection between encounters in an adventure is commonly referred to as nodes. There's a great post by Justin Alexander about node-based scenario design on his website, which delves into this subject. I will leave a link in the video description for you. The manner through which those nodes are arranged can lead to different structures. Linear adventures, non-linear adventures, and branched adventures. In linear adventures, encounter A leads to encounter B, which leads to encounter C, and so on. Some don't like this structure because they think it leads to railroading. I beg to disagree, as this is only one possible way player agency can manifest. As long as players can develop their own strategy to tackle each encounter and they have the chance of succeeding or failing, they are not being railroaded. Of course, linear adventures deliver less player freedom than other adventures structures but they are much easier to design and they increase the chances that players will fully use all the work the DM has put into preparing encounters. Its main issue to me is another one. As there are no alternative routes, one encounter failure may lead to failure on the entire adventure goal. Or it may lead to a situation in which neither players nor DM knows what to do, which is even worse. So, if I'm running a linear adventure, I always try to have an answer to this question. What happens if the players fail in one encounter? That usually helps me prevent situations like that. Non-linear adventures are the extreme opposite of that. The adventure hook or its initial encounter immediately unlocks all other adventure encounters. In other words, players can freely choose which encounter to face in any order. If players succeed in all or some encounters, they either achieve the adventure goal or unlock the final encounter. That's one way of designing a sandbox adventure. It provides players with the highest degree of freedom and best accommodate failure in individual encounters, as there are alternative routes that players can take to achieve the adventure's final goal. Such adventures have two potential, potential side effects. One, they are more complex to design. After all, the whole adventure has to, to make sense regardless of the multiple routes available for players to take. It's especially complex if the adventure is heavily inclined towards storytelling, as the story also has to make sense despite those different routes. When designing non-linear adventures, I also put much thought into the number of successful encounters players must achieve to succeed in the entire adventure. That establishes a critical trade-off. Suppose players must succeed in only a few encounters. In that case, it, it, it gives players higher freedom and better handles failure in individual encounters, but enhances the design complexity and the amount of unused work. On the other hand, if players must succeed in all encounters, it reduces player freedom and punishes encounter failure but it reduces the design complexity and ensures that most prep work will be used, as I know that players will probably have to, uh, to work their way through all encounters. Branch of Adventures is the, are the middle path. In them, every encounter may unlock one or more encounters. It's really helpful to design an encounter flowchart when designing branched adventures. The simplest branch of the adventure offers players simply an alternative order of encounters. 
It helps to think of encounters in layers. A first layer encounter unlocks two or more second, second layer encounters. Players must tackle all second layer encounters to unlock the following third layer encounters, but they can do so in whichever order they want. They provide a bit more player freedom than linear adventures in exchange for a bit more complexity in its design. Branched adventures can also offer the players alternative routes. In that case, a first layer encounter unlocks two or more second layer encounters. Players can choose which of the second layer encounters to tackle and they need to succeed in only one to unlock one or more of the following third layer encounters. Each second layer encounter may unlock the same third layer encounter, different third layer encounters, or a mix of them. For instance, encounter A unlocks encounters B and C in the second layer, but encounter B unlocks encounters D and E, while encounter C unlocks encounters E and F. Such adventures provide greater freedom and alternative routes that players may take if they happen to fail in one of them. But as always, the trade-off is a higher burden for the DM in the form of design, complexity, and unused work. My Diplomacy with the Giants quest is an example of a branched adventure with alternative routes. The initial encounter allows players to engage in dangerous diplomatic talks with the giant. If they do, they engage in encounter B in the second layer. If, and if they succeed in negotiating with the, giant, the Giants' alliance, they unlock encounter C in the third layer. If they fail, the only option is to move ahead to the siege without the Giants. I'm calling that encounter D. It's similar to encounter C, except players don't have the Giants' help. Likewise, if players opt not to engage with the, the, with the Giants, they move directly to the same encounter D. The great benefit of alternative routes like that is providing all that freedom. Players can choose where they want to go, they are rewarded for taking the risk and succeeding, and if they fail in one encounter, there is an alternative route for them to still succeed in the adventure. But which of those adventure structures do I like the most? Well, all of them. What I really try to do is choose which of them better fits what I'm creating. As long as I know those are the tools available in my design toolkit and that I have clear in my mind the trade-offs between player freedom and handling failure on the one hand and design complexity and unused work on the other hand, I can consciously choose which of those structures work be works best for each situation. So I hope that helps you to organize your toolkit as well. All right, we talked about what I do to link encounters to each other within an adventure. But one important part is missing. The one thing that compels my players to move from one encounter to the next. I call that encounter triggers. There are very different ways to place encounter triggers in an adventure. Sandbox adventures provide an exciting example of how subtle an encounter trigger can be. So let's start with that. Designing sandbox adventures was never my preferred approach, and I confess I didn't like them at all. Then I realized that, well, I didn't really know how to use them. So I wanted to share why I learned they are actually powerful tools even for someone who values storytelling and role-playing the most, like myself. My insight came when I incorporated the village of Gwark into my campaign. Gwark was a trading post of the Tearrock on Water Goblins, a tribe first mentioned in a book called Elminster's Ecologies. However, the village of Gwark itself was never mentioned in any official material, except for a name on the 4th edition Cormier regional map, published in the Dragon Magazine issue of July 2008. That gave me what I needed for my campaign, a non-human village in the arid stonelands. And this is the cool map three friends of mine, Paulo, Caio and Sandro, helped me first to design and then illustrate. 
I love its flavor with, with its dry soil, rigged bay area, and earth mounts linked by wooden bridges. In addition, it features unexpected and weird locations, such as a lighthouse, a temple with a giant turtle skull, and sulfurous water pools. Those locations immediately attracted my players' curiosity, who were eager to go there and check them out. Settlements make great sandboxes because they have what I call description encounter triggers. So many things were going on on Gwok, but they didn't need to be told through a linear approach. That allowed me to hide the storytelling blocks in each of those locations, sometimes in the hands of NPCs the characters would interact with, sometimes in the locations themselves, or in objects or events that were going on in each area that allowed me to hand over to my players where they wanted to start to uncover their adventure story, along with the great freedom for their exploration. But what are encounter triggers to begin with? They're the connection that compel players to go from one encounter to another. We're used to the simplest of them all. The party receives a quest that triggers them to move toward the subsequent encounter. I like to think of encounter triggers in two dimensions. The first dimension is their nature. Triggers can be information, clues, or descriptions. An information trigger is a clear fact or knowledge about a subsequent encounter the party may pursue. I like to use it to lead the party to an encounter that is essential for the adventure's development. For example, suppose the characters are dealing with a stray werewolf in the city, and uh, an NPC says, there's a sage who knows, about, who knows much about lycanthropes. Maybe you should consult with him. It's a straightforward statement about an available encounter. Contrary to information, Clue triggers only provide partial information or signs that can help players to develop a hypothesis or answer a question. If they get it right, that should lead them to a new encounter. I like to use clue triggers when I want to provide optional encounters the party can pursue. Typically, that encounter should make their life easier as a reward for getting the clue right. Using the previous example, it may be that while the characters are talking to that sage in his bookshop, they notice claw marks in one of his bookshelves. What could that mean? Did the werewolf attack him? Is the sage himself actually the werewolf? Will the characters ask him directly about the claw marks or discreetly note that down and keep it for themselves? that could lead the characters to follow the sage during that full moon night to rule that out, which in turn could provide an easier path for them to solve the mystery. The last encounter trigger I like to use are the description triggers. Again, sandboxes are the environment where they shine. Just, I li just like I mentioned for the village of Wark, the only information provided to players are the characterizations of the available locations. They work the best for me when there's some compelling fact or twist about those locations. That's usually enough to compel players to get curious and start exploring a few of those locations, where of course, a few encounters will happen. But how can those encounter triggers be conveyed? How are those information, clues, and descriptions made available for the characters? That's the second dimension I like to think about encounter triggers. They're media. I try to organize my th myself thinking of the five Ws. Who for NPCs, what for objects, where for locations, why for events, and when for time. Any of those five media can communicate a trigger for the characters. The first W, who or NPCs, is quite intuitive, as it's very common to use NPCs as triggers, like in the example of one character mentioning the existence of a werewolf sage that could be of help. The second W, what or objects, is handy for making things exciting and unexpected. It can be a letter, a book, a rune, a painting, 
or even claw marks on a bookshelf. The where or locations is similar to objects, but instead it's an entire location that provides the trigger. The descriptions of my locations in the village of Gork are good ex examples of such a trigger. The fourth W, why or events, is something that happens that provides players with an encounter trigger. For example, in our werewolf quest, it could be that the beast kills someone next to him, opening another line of investigation and encounters that the characters could follow. The last W, when or time, is a bit different, as it typically marks an in-game moment when an encounter trigger is disclosed. In this previous example, it could be that the werewolf is set to kill its victim on the third night from the beginning of the adventure. It's still an event, a why, but it's triggered not by the characters interacting in an encounter and instead set to happen at a particular in-game moment. When establishing encounter triggers for my adventures, I'm pretty much combining those two dimensions. I'm providing the players with information, clues, or descriptions, and I'm doing that through NPCs, objects, locations, events, or at previously established in-game time. Clearly establishing those concepts in my mind allowed me to be much more creative in designing the links between my adventure encounters, making them more exciting and immersive for my players. It proved to be another helpful tool in my DM utility belt, and hopefully it will be useful for you too. We talked about a lot of things, so let's try to wrap it up. We all love player freedom and immersive storytelling in our adventures, but the combination of those two things can quickly escalate to a very large amount of work for a DM. Keeping a balance among those things is not only healthy, but many times necessary. There are two things I did to give my players more freedom without overwhelming myself, and I always try to keep them in mind. One. When I design my adventures, I think of encounter nodes, the connection among encounters. Different builds of encounter nodes lead to three possible adventure structures. Linear adventures are the simplest design. To avoid railroading, it's important that my players are free to solve each encounter with their own approach. The crucial issue on such adventures is ensuring that if players fail in one encounter, there are safeguards for them not to fail in the entire adventure. Non-linear adventures are the extreme opposite. The initial encounter unlocks all other encounters, and players must succeed in all or part of them to succeed in the adventure. In branched adventures, one encounter may unlock one or more of the following encounters. That provides players with either an alternative order to tackle encounters or alternative routes to complete the adventure. Each structure implies trade-offs between player freedom and design workload. They, they also offer trade-offs between alternatives to player failure and unused adventure encounters. Two, an adventure structure is not complete without encounter triggers, which are what compel players from one encounter to the next. I like to think of encounter triggers in two dimensions. The first dimension is the nature of encounter triggers. Information triggers are clear facts or knowledge that lead players to the following encounters. Clue triggers are partial information or signs that can lead, to, lead players to new encounters. Description triggers are simply characterizations of locations that stimulate players' curiosity and compel them to explore. Another dimension for encounter triggers is their media. It helps me think of the five W's to determine the means through which a trigger is communicated to the players. Who is for NPCs, what is for objects, where is for locations, why is for events, and when is for an encounter trigger that is planned to happen at a certain point of in-game time, such as the third night from the start of the adventure. Learning in practice about those elements and thinking about what they are and how to best use them, use them for different situations have taken my ability to design adventures to a different level. There are valuable tools that I try to have ready in my tool set. 
I wish I'd, I'd had someone to discuss them with me while I was learning the ropes and getting better at being a DM. And I hope they prove useful for you too. If you're interested in the content of this video and want to know more about it, click on the link on the description below to download our booklet, Make Your Character Matter. It's free. You can also find more related content on our social networks. All links are available in the description below. If you want to check out a module where we apply all concepts discussed in this channel, look out for our new campaign, The Kingdom of Cormier, One Purple Raven, available this year. Clicking on the screen, you may find more videos on creating exciting D&D adventures and characters. If you think our content might be interesting for you, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to receive notifications for new content. This video makes part of our series on how to create great D&D campaigns. In this series, we discuss what we believe to be the core elements of an outstanding D&D campaign for players who enjoy role-playing and storytelling great characters and great stories. In the Great Characters videos, we talk about the importance of backstories, allies, bringing the party together, and how to connect all of that into an outstanding D&D campaign. In the Great Stories videos, we discuss topics such as building up tension and suspense, plot lines, plot twists, villains and patrons, as well as advanced storytelling techniques. And yet, the best way to create great adventures is to get inspiration from great ideas. So be sure to share your great ideas and experiences in the comments down below. What was the best adventure you've ever designed and why? I'm sure your experience will inspire not only us, but many others. Thank you for sharing this moment with us. We are the Deep Dice Press.